and for tycoons of small biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm here as always, Austin Peterson, with my co-host Landon Mance, who happens to be in studio this week, all the way from Las Vegas. And we're happy to have in studio as well Bobby Machado with Signa Marketing here in downtown Phoenix. They're a uh, digital marketing company, and we'll let him tell us a little bit about uh, what it is that they do. So, Bobby, thanks for being here with us today. Oh, of course. No, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be on the on, on this episode, and uh, uh, kind of just to give you guys just a, a, a brief background on Signa and uh, and whatnot. Uh, we're a local digital marketing agency here in downtown Phoenix. Uh, we've been around for uh, almost six years now. Um, it started mainly just as a web shop, and then uh, my uh, expertise in, in the marketing aspect kind of took off more. Um, and uh, ever, ever since, we've been just focusing on helping small businesses and brands um, expand their, their online presence and, and so forth. Yeah, we're looking forward to talking to you a little bit about that and what you guys do specifically here locally in Phoenix and potentially nationwide. But before we jump into the business side of things, we usually like to have our, our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. So, you know, I, I don't know if you're married, if you have any kids, your family, just give us a little bit of background on, on your family life and, and how that uh, has kind of led you to where you are today. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I was actually born in um, Denver, Colorado. And weird thing is I had not been back since I was three years old. And we just went back uh, uh, two weeks ago as a family. Um, so that was really cool, just to reconnect. Uh, and we even went to the home where I spent <laughs> the first <laughs> years of my life there and all that good stuff. So it was really neat. Um, but for the majority of my life, I've lived out here in Phoenix, uh, uh, mainly in Buckeye, um, which is why I was, was always around like dirt bikes and horses and all that stuff, because um, you can't get in trouble in the city, so you're going to find <laughs> things to do outside <laughs> and stuff. Uh, so, but yeah, my, uh, my, my family, uh, my immediate family is all here. Um, I have some family in Tucson, uh, and then of course, like my cousins and stuff like that in, in Colorado. So, um, so yeah, it, but for the majority of my life, yeah, definitely Arizona. I feel like a native uh, at this point for sure. Cool. Yeah, it's definitely a good time of year to visit Colorado as well. Get up into the high country a little bit, cooler weather. Oh, it was beautiful. I, I, if anything, I, um, I think, uh, uh, well, I have a brother, a younger brother. I'm the oldest of three, so I have a younger brother and then a, a younger sister, and I think both. Uh, Cesar and I, because Cesar was born in Littleton out there, um, we looked at each other and were like, why did we leave? Like, Colorado's so awesome. <laughs> but the thing is that um, there's a lot of beauty to Arizona, too. There's a lot you can do. And I was like, you know what? That airplane ride's only an hour and a half. That's not too bad. You can get some work done on the way there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, as a guy who spent most of his life outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, I would say go there in February, shovel a couple of really big driveways, and then tell me you still want to live there. That, that's a good point. That That's actually the main reason why my mom, when I was once I was four years old, she told my dad, she's like, we're leaving because those blizzards just got too bad. And she's, she's like, yeah, I, I need a, we need to chill out on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my family, you know, makes mention specifically about, you know, they call it the surface of the sun where we live and, you know, all that, sim you know, all those sorts of things. And, and my response is always, you don't shovel sunshine. That's so That's a good, that's <laughs> a good <laughs> response. That's true. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. I, I mean, I actually, I love, I love Utah and Colorado. I lived in Colorado for a little bit when I was in junior high school. My dad worked at Stapleton Airport there. And um, I they're great places to, to live. They're actually great places to visit as well. The outdoors, I mean, it, it's tough to find better states in our country that have more to offer from an outdoor standpoint mm -hmm. but yeah I, it, if i were to ever live in colorado or utah again i would i would have to have a heated driveway right <laughs> and, and they and they do yeah. actually make those right yeah. you can put oh, like wow. a hot water heater system in the driveway so that it just melts the snow as soon as it lands on there yeah. Oh, that's cool. I did not Bobby, know Bobby, I, I got to ask, though, before I move on from this uh, topic. Yeah. Because you hear mixed uh, uh, mixed uh, things from people when they go back to their childhood home, you know, and you yeah. 
So I don't know if you went up and knocked on the door and said, hey, I used to live here. Can I, you know, tour the house? <laughs> but yeah. uh, is that what you did? We were about to, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> you, okay. So, so you just. Yeah, because okay. my parents, um, we actually got to go to the apartment where they started their life essentially together before I existed. <laughs> Um, and we were we went up to the apartment. There's a lady coming out, and they got to talking. And then she's like, "Oh my gosh, you guys lived here!" And she's like, "You guys want to come in and check it out?" <laughs> so our whole family's in there just checking out this apartment. Uh, and we're like, "Okay, maybe we should do that with the house too." But I was like, "Let's not push it." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You sh- you should have. My my older sister. We we lived in the same house for a number of years growing up. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple years ago, my sister went up and uh, just knocked on the door. And uh, at the time. So it's a married couple, man and a woman. And at the time, only the husband was home. Mm-hmm. So he was giving her a tour of the house, and his wife came home and apparently was not nearly as friendly <laughs> as husband. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he, you know, my sister said that when, you know, she she came in and she introduced herself right away. Oh yeah, you know, we grew up in this house, and she 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 was not too excited uh, <laughs> to uh, have her in there checking it out. So I was just curious what your experience was, but. Seems yeah, like I, I need some context here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, oh boy, yeah. Some some people think it's pretty weird, right? But uh, yeah, m- my wife will never have that experience. We have taken our kids. So my kids mm-hmm. are twenty and seventeen. We've taken our kids to see the first apartment that we lived in as a married couple, and you know a few things like that, which I think we thought was way cooler than our kids thought. They're like, oh, that okay, <laughs> that's that's cool, yeah. right? <laughs> but they're twenty and seventeen, so nothing's really that cool anyway, right? But um yeah my my wife will never have that experience her her parents have lived in the same house since 1969 wow. and they're wow. in you know they're 91 and 86 Man. um they'll they'll likely pass on in in that home and so you know and my wife was born in 1974 so it's the only house she's ever known oh wow, wow. Yeah, that's, that's special right there that's yeah. that's really cool yeah yeah pretty cool uh pretty cool deal so you mentioned your brother cesar yeah and i know you guys do a little bit uh in business together as well so tell us a little bit more about your relationship with him and what you guys do from a business standpoint together yeah ab- absolutely um so cesar he's definitely a, a analytical mind uh for sure he works at uh honeywell as a, a test engineer um and so um hi- him kind of being you know doing that as as a full gig and stuff like that um has always been kind of his thing I th- I I don't think he looked necessarily at entrepreneurship until one of our clients um, at the time we had built them a, a e-commerce website and so forth and um, the gentleman he was uh, closer to well uh, I think he's 66 now or so so he was he was at that point where he was like you know what I'm managing this business on my own um, and uh, I'm I'm ready to 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 pass it on um, so we were presented a great opportunity great deal um, I between Cigna and Sector 7, I was like, I'm not, I can't do this on my own. Like, I need help. <laughs> so I told my brother, I was like, you know, uh, would you want to go in on this deal um, and and uh, essentially kind of re- resurrect this this company? Um, Quick Job uh, uh, was, it has been around for 37 years. It was built from door-to-door sales. Wow. So, so Mike McLean, um, the previous owner, he had scaled it uh uh for w- with w- uh with the whole team to 25 sales reps you know door to door sales um nowadays of course you're not going to do the door to door sales a- as much and so when 2008 happened um with the whole crash uh he had to kind of he had to let go of the whole team and uh at that point the site was hardly doing any of the overall sales so his sales plummeted and for the last uh 9 10 years um, it's been consistent with the, the the loyal customer base, but there's been no active pushing of marketing or getting the m- the message uh, message out there or, or anything like that. So, um, so the fact that it's been so steady, s- super loyal customer base, we said, you know what, this is a great deal, and um, uh, being able to use the resources from Cigna and stuff like that, um, we've been able to to amp it up from from that side. But um, but yeah, so Cesar is great because he handles a lot of the operations, a lot all the shipping, all that stuff like that, while I handle a lot of the the messaging and the marketing side of things. Yeah, cool. So how long ago did you pull the trigger on that transaction? Uh, that was January 2019. Oh. Yeah. So that was that was fun because uh, it had it was headquartered in Las Vegas, and so um, you know, we had a a, n- a nice rental from U-Haul and got like all the inventory that was there, like uh, so er- I mean everything was boxes and stuff like that, and and brought it over and um and ever since yeah we've been uh, managing that together. And 
I, I think uh, with Quick Job, uh, more so in the last three months, it's more looking at the retail opportunities. That's one thing that Quick Job was always direct to consumer. And so now um, we're looking at, you know, well, how do we get to the mass quicker, um, especially through, uh, throughout these times. And, and to be honest, I mean, cleaning products, they're not sexy. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, it, it, that's a challenge. And so, yeah, from a retail aspect, that's where we've been putting a little bit more work into for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's fu it's funny. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit on on past shows, where you know a lot of these companies that people don't think of as sexy, right? So yeah. it's not building websites, it's not it's not doing uh, digital marketing, it's not any of these you know tech boom type of of jobs or mm -hmm. or businesses that are out there. But there are some really strong, steady businesses that are just mundane, everyday, you know, Joe lunch bucket type of of companies that guys make guys and gals make tons and tons of money doing yeah no that that's true and and looking at even yeah how, how you mentioned i mean just some of the, some of these industries are just enormous um i i until quick job came around i never dove into you know why you know dove and companies that are uh you know doing consumer products for um in, in that sense are just you know billion dollar companies i never understood revenue wise w why um, and once I looked into it, I was like, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense because uh, with Quick Job, even f uh, you know, there's 330 million Americans, av you know, averaging, and if we had even one percent of the market, that's an enormous business. Yeah. <laughs> I d once I looked at that point, I was like, oh, okay, that this makes much more sense. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, cool. Ma th maybe there's room there for us to squeeze in <laughs> this market. Yeah. Well, well, we we even had a guest maybe. S six to eight weeks ago or so that one of his exits was a cleaning products company. Oh, wow. And he's now got a different, you know, company that he's that he's building and doing quite well with. But, yeah, his he had an exit with cleaning products. Corey Yates with Alpha and Omega Repair, he's he sold a cleaning products uh, business, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, that that's awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunity in, in um, in that, that, that in industry. I mean, I think even more so right now, um, cleaning products are probably, you know, pretty hot right now. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those things that's a necessity too. It's not something that's gonna necessarily go away unless you kind of pull the, 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 you know, the throttle off on marketing and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, so we're really excited to, to keep pushing forward and, um, and see where the, the retail side of things takes us for sure. That's, that's a new arena for me. So I, I had to do my homework and, uh, really understand, okay, well, you know, what are buyers looking for? You know, what what the, what are they considering? Um, how much uh, sales do you have to probably be at already for them to even look at you? Stuff like that. And so, um, so that's been fun. But I love kind of going into uh, new territory, and then kind of it's like a personal challenge, really, to kind of see like, okay, can am I can I do this? Like, uh, and and kind of take it from there. It's I think it's like the competitive side of me of just like competing with personally myself to see like can I do it or can I not type of deal yeah well I think that that internal drive is something that all entrepreneurs have to have yeah right I mean y you're not always going to have somebody that you can compete with directly other than yourself and so having that internal drive and that uh, that internal you know whatever it is that pushes you to get out of out of bed in the morning is is really what makes the difference between a successful entrepreneur and and one that doesn't quite make it Oh, that's that's such a great point. I was um, uh, so about a month and a half ago, because uh, I, I took a rest from hiking <laughs> for the last month. But I was hiking Squaw Peak with a friend, and we were talking um, about work and, and all that good stuff like that. Because I, I mean, I guess a lot of my friends uh, will say like, "Oh, do you get too stressed out?" They think the stress is uh, they see it differently because it, it's it's just different perspectives. Um, but uh, but I was trying to explain how I'm excited for Monday mornings. Uh, because it's my, my chance to, to make more progress and, and all that good stuff with the team. Um, and and uh, it, it, it's funny because, yeah, you, when you say that to, to some people, they'll, they'll be like, are you weird? You're crazy. Like, or that doesn't make sense to me. Um, but, uh, but that is one, a bi one big difference I, I definitely see is, like, you know, if you love what you do, you're excited to, to start the week. And Sunday you're kind of already mentally ramping up in, in that sense, you know. Yeah, understood. So we talk about that not being a real sexy business, and since <laughs> Landon's here in in studio, let's try to sexy things up a little bit, <laughs> and uh, and talk about digital marketing a little bit. And yeah. What specifically got you interested in in digital marketing back in the day? So um, 
So, uh, I guess I'll, I'll give you guys a, a little bit long form uh, for for context, but uh, because I, I it's never it's not like I ever you know was young and said oh I, I love marketing so much this is what I'm gonna do this is my pa you know it wasn't from that angle. Um, uh, as a child, I, w I was always um, almost kind of like uh, at uh, of service. I really liked uh, when I was fifth sixth grade. I started doing landscaping routes and. Um, uh, I I did it, I wanted money to be able to do uh, you know buy my whatever toy I wanted a bike or whatever like that. Um, uh, even as a fifth, fifth fifth sixth grade, I probably was still buying some stuff in terms of toys. But um, uh, but doing that, uh, I was built my my routes in the neighborhoods. Um, and uh, and from there, um, that I think that in that that drive kind of always just o was always there. So even went throughout high school. Um, I started s was still doing like odd jobs and stuff like that um, around neighborhoods or, or anything like that. And so what happened was I started to um, get into like apparel companies and apparel designs and, and stuff like that. So I would do some exploratory clothing lines and, and so forth. Um, but to do th those items, you have to have a website. You have to uh, understand social media. You have to do uh, all these side uh, things on the digital marketing side of things, um, which really exposed me to building websites. And just like that, that drive that was always in me, I said, okay, well, now that I know how to build websites, I should just go build websites <laughs> and sell <laughs> these. So, um, so that was junior high, uh, or junior year and senior year were the main years in high school that I was actually uh, uh, building sites. Um, weirdly enough, uh, I kick myself in the butt now, but like sophomore year, I remember using Dreamweaver in class and wondering what the heck are we doing? Like, I don't even know what this thing does type of deal. Uh, and so it was just really weird that the next year I was learning HTML and, and stuff like that. So I think it was just completely like the interest level. Um, in sophomore year, I was just completely, you know, uh, numb to it almost. Uh, but yeah, but from there, I was selling websites. It was a love-hate relationship because um, uh, I was always by myself. It was in, always in Buckeye. I was never going out networking. I wasn't meeting other uh, developers or anything like that. And so it was a love-hate relationship um, for about four or five years. Um, and then I got into selling Google ads um, for a bit. And I was already uh, familiar with Google advertising, but I, did not, I didn't know the mechanics of it or anything like that. So once I got into um, selling that it for, I mean, that sales job lasted like three months because uh, it, it wasn't my thing. But, um, but it was great because it exposed me to Google ads, and it also allowed me to be able to explain it really well. So from there, I got a job, um, my, my first real, real job at an agency um, as a paid media specialist. And that was the, the, the one where uh, it was a team of three, of, uh, three of us. And we essentially managed the uh, paid media for uh, almost 135 um, car dealerships across the US. So Midway Nissan, Peoria Nissan, a lot of those um, types of uh, uh, dealerships um, uh, is what they were servicing. and so. Uh, we're ma managing a little over a million uh, a month in ad spend uh, between three of us. And so for me, what, uh, what allowed me to learn was seeing uh, data uh, at a high volume. Because when you see data at a high volume, you can learn much, much faster. Um, it's really tough if you have like, you know, a small business campaign and you're seeing the dat data come through, but it sometimes it takes a little bit longer to make certain decisions. Um, but at that volume, you can see data um, very quickly. The other cool thing is that you're seeing it all within one industry. So a lot of those behaviors, you start to see like that certain geographic locations behave differently or uh, certain different makes and models behave differently in terms of interest levels and, and so forth. So um, so I was there for almost two years. And um, and I, I, again, it's just a bug that, that's in you that you're like, you know, I mean, I, I th I'm always gonna probably b build something for myself type of deal. And so, um, so even though I was super grateful for the opportunity and you know working there and the experience too, um, that's when I pulled the trigger to move out from there and um, and uh, start Signa. And really, my goal with that was to be able to take uh, all the experience I've seen from a, from a high level, uh, seeing a lot of data come through and, and the tactics that um, that work for for uh, you know big companies in, in, in that sense, and bring it down more to the small business level. Um, just because, especially like Google Ads, Bing Ads, um, even Facebook and LinkedIn, it's just super complicated for someone to get in there if they've never touched the platform. If it's the first time, it's just overwhelming. There's a lot of moving pieces. 
Um, and even though these platforms do a good job of trying to explain you know, how to set these campaigns up and stuff like that, there's a lot of um, tactics and just nuances to the, to the craft itself um, that really only built uh, over time with experience. And so, um, so that's the inspiration that, you know, that really drove Cigna and why, since I already had this web development background, we were building websites, but it, it almost, um, I mean, it almost serves as like the first project that we ever do sometimes with a, with a client because we know that the, we're, we have to make that website work for them to produce sales or leads. Um, and so then that's where the PPC uh, side of things comes into play and, and all that good stuff. But um, but yeah, so I mean, I, uh, if I had to kind of um, categorize with, with Cigna, our, our three three main um, services is paid media, SEO, um, and website development. So those are those are the th the three, pretty much the, the core to, to to Cigna there. Yeah, gotcha. <coughs> uh, I feel like there, with a lot of small business owners, I feel like there's still kind of a mystique, you know, <laughs> around digital marketing. You know what I mean? And I, I think that it's because y you've already you've already said it well. I mean, we there's a lot of moving parts. It's confusing, especially if you're not a techie, which um, I I am certainly not. Um, so I, I think that you know you just get confused right and, mm -hmm. and so and sometimes when we get confused we tend to shy away from from a subject you know a, a subject or a topic or uh, a business that we don't really understand so um, when you're when you're helping a business you know manage their quote unquote online presence um, help us understand like walk us through what what's important what do you need to focus on you know, give us some tips and tricks for, you know, managing somebody's online presence. A absolutely. Um, at, at first, I always uh, like to s start at a home base. So foundation is everything because if you don't have, uh, in foundation, I'm, I'm referring to your actual website, which is your storefront online. Um, uh, because y you can market a message all, all day out there, but if it's not uh, strategized and you don't have that foundation in place, uh, if anything, you can you can essentially lose a lot of money in marketing um, because it's not going to resonate or produce a ROI at, at, at that point. So um, looking at the, the actual website itself and the website experience and the messaging and messaging meaning like all the content that's on the site. Um, is it the, is the site easy to navigate? Is it clear to understand what um, the the company is about and what they're offering right when they land on the home page without having to scroll down the fold? Uh, that's why we have uh, really just core elements that uh, almost any website should really have on a home page or on a service page, uh, like an inner page or, or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of foundation elements that need to be put in place. Uh, now more so than ever, uh, search engine optimization really needs to be baked into the actual strategy of the user, the user experience of the site. So even the design of the site uh, uh, requires some SEO uh, fluency to kind of integrate in there because um, the uh, the content needs to be optimized for search engines. Uh, search engines are grading your website's user experience. Are people sticking on the site? Um, are they taking action? All that good stuff. And so uh, now more than ever, it's it you you actually do see a lot more integration between content marketing teams, SEO teams, um, and and designers working together. Which before wasn't ever really like that. It's before it's you know get your website built. Okay, it's live. Okay, cool. A SEO agency comes through, rips up some stuff, uh, change some pages. Like, and even at that point, you're like, well, this page, this site actually changed about 25 percent. Why didn't we just do this all at once, type of deal? And so, um, so, so the great thing is that you're actually seeing a lot of agencies uh, partnering up too to be able to uh, better serve their clients. You're seeing a lot of uh, web shops partnering partnering up with. Um, strategic partnerships with with other digital agencies so that the client can essentially win and, and have a, a site that's uh, built to work. So once you have that actual foundation, then you can confidently say, hey, you know what, now we can put some money behind it, which is the gasoline mm -hmm. to uh, to produce some leads or some sales. Um, and, and at that point, it, it's uh, much more secure of, of an investment. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, a way to, to kind of do it a, a, a in a sketchy way is to build a site that's you know 50 percent there you know it, it looks nice but you know there's definitely some flaws in terms of the messaging or the clarity of it 
um, and then you say, you know what, let's just throw some money at it. That's the that's definitely the the way where small business owners tend to then get discouraged because they know they they just invested some money, they didn't get anything out of it, and then um, a lot of times it gets blamed on the platform itself or you know the algorithm or anything like that. But um, the the one thing that I've always loved about digital marketing is that the playing field's always getting leveled consistently. Uh, there's always new, um, uh, not just platforms, but new features to each, uh, all these platforms. You know, Google Ads will release a new ad extension mm -hmm. um, that, I I in our case, we like to test it right away uh, because we know that uh, a lot of uh, others may wait five, six months to test it. We, li we like to rapid test these new features up front, um, but it's great because it, it even with us not knowing, we know that other people didn't know about it because it's a new feature. So it, it, it levels the playing field in that sense um, a lot. Um, and then, I mean, with devices changing so much, um, even even more so now too, where you have um, really just uh, web apps and websites almost like merging in terms of behavior and, and interface and stuff like that. Um, that's another thing that's it's leveling the playing field. Everyone has to kind of relearn these things and. Um, continue to self-educate. It doesn't matter where, what level you're at. You kind of always have to be self-educating in, in this uh, industry for sure. Yeah. So you you set the stage perfectly for my next question. So you and I, we had a conversation off air, um, you know, several weeks ago when we were talking about having you come on the show, and I had shared my experience with you, which mm -hmm. was uh, basically uh, uh, what you what you kind of referred to as the sketchy way, right? <laughs> that 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 was me. That was me. Yeah. So help us understand, uh, help our listeners understand our, 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 you know, our tycoons. There's a lot of digital advertising marketing agencies out there, right? So, you know, how do you sift through them and find the right fit for you and for your business and what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, um, uh, and, and if anything, w with, with sketchiness, when I use that word, uh, I have, uh, like, I totally get it, too, because you're a business owner. You're, like, ready to get things going. You want to see the leads coming through. Like, I, you, you got that ants and that energy. I, so I, like, totally get it. Like, I don't, I don't uh, if anything, I don't blame any business owners uh, for that, um, uh, for that energy, you know. Um, but uh, it is, I mean, digital marketing is getting saturated for sure. There's a ton of agencies. The um, point, like, the entry to the, to the industry um Essentially, uh, I'll I'll be careful with words, but like it, it could be really easy to get into because y as long as you learn this knowledge on Google, and then you, and then if you're good at sales, you could essentially get into it and just start selling and not have any experience. So that's a that's a tough part because a lot of people have been burned by that. Um, and so so when you're looking for a digital marketing agency, make sure that they do present case studies um, that you essentially interview them a little bit more at depth for sure. Um, whole more digital agencies are trying to make that easier because that puts a lot of strain on the, the business owner to have to essentially interview a ton of agencies. That's time and time is money type of deal. So um, the more that agencies up front can show you know, their case studies, um, uh, whether it's even like a white paper or, or anything like that, but um, e either way, the actual homework has to definitely be done to finding the right agency that actually meets your exact needs. Um, more specifically, even try to find agencies that specialize in a niche or in a particular service. Um, that That's drilling down even more because, and this is funny because I was talking to a client about this too, is the fact that um, because the evolution of the digital marketing is happening so fast, there's new platforms and these fat platforms are actually getting more sophisticated there's more that a person has to learn to, to really uh, be uh, proficient at it. So, I mean, I wouldn't really be surprised that you'd have start, you'd start having agencies that, I mean, they, or actually they already exist too, that they only do Facebook advertising. That's it. They don't touch anything else. They won't do websites. They, won't, they just do only Facebook advertising. Um, and the reason why is because there's so much to learn just from Facebook alone to then have the expertise to then accurately and uh, professionally service the clients. So, so that's wh why um, I, I think for small business owners, if they're looking for something specific, um, and let's say for, for example, lead generation, focus on finding uh, an agency that 
is focused only on lead generation, or if they're big enough and they have a di you know a division that only does lead generation, then that then that's great. Um, uh, that's probably one of my highest recommendation you know recommendations there, um, because if you get go with generalist agencies um, that may not have the specialization, um, it can work really well if you're a business that's looking for that. If you're looking for an agency that could do it all for you. Um, and they have the teams and in place, and they can they can do it. Um, then that's great, but um, but sometimes there could be generalist agencies that don't they have not specialized yet or have any special specialization in, internally. Um, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes the client can lose in that sense in terms of results, and then of course like the expense uh, from the engagement and stuff like that. So I'd say make sure that you for the small business owner to really do thorough homework. I mean, this is someone, this is a, a, a essentially a, an extension of your team, um, and you don't want to just hire anyone. You know, it's the same as you're, you're building your team, you don't want to just hire someone on the first interview. So, um, you know, make sure that you do two, three, four interviews. I, I think, I mean, now it's getting even more, comp I, I kind of look at it almost like these big companies like Amazon, stuff like that, where you'll do the sixth in interview and then you don't get a call back. <laughs> 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 like, like it's like really, really thorough, really in depth. Um, I think it, it, I think it's getting to that point where more small business owners do have to look at it more from that point of view. Um, don't just go by the price sheet. You know, go by you know who who's on the team, uh, what's their expertise, all that good stuff like that. And a lot of times, times you know the outcome will be uh, more positive at that point. Yeah, I think that's really good advice in a, in a lot of different arenas, right? I mean, it, it's there are so many groups out there that do so many different things, whether it's digital marketing or financial advice or you know y you name it. A and there's a and a lot of a lot of these industries can have pretty low barriers to entry, like you mentioned, and so it's really hard without doing multiple interviews to know whether or not they truly know what it is that they're providing. Th that's exactly it. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And I mean, uh, if anything, a lot of times, um, if we get a prospective client, um, I, I kind of a lot of times even encourage, hey, go go interview two, three, f more, so that you personally have context, right. so that you could feel like you know when you go home at night, you made the best decision. You know, at at, at, th at that point, I mean, it's it's all about their business, and the business is providing for their family, and 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 all so it's a big decision. It's not just. Uh, you know, hey, I went to the store and picked this up type of deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know about you, Landon, but I, I tell you what, when somebody talks about Dreamweaver and HTML in high school, it makes me feel like I'm 100 years old. <laughs> you know, it's like that, that was not even a topic of conversation <laughs> when I was in high school, that's for sure. So this is the perfect time to take a quick word from our sponsor. We'll listen to that, and then we come back. we got some questions for you about what the future holds. Awesome. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back. We're here with uh, Signa Marketing and Bobby Machado talking a little bit about digital marketing today. and kind of what the future holds, what the past looked like. And, you know, I made that comment before the break about feeling 100 years old when you mentioned those things in high school. And just to give you some context to that, after I graduated high school is when a friend of mine started talking to me about buying stock in this little company called America Online. So <laughs> that gives you an idea of just how old I am compared to uh, somebody who kind of grew up in the digital marketing space. <laughs> and did, you, did you get in on that stock? I did not. <laughs> I was le I was leaving the country for a couple of years, yeah. and I had a thousand bucks, and I felt like I needed to leave that in a savings account to get ready to go back to school, buy clothes, buy books, you mm -hmm. know, all those sorts of things to get back in, in uh, into things. And I wish I would have because you know I, <laughs> I looked at it afterwards, and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> But if I'd taken uh. that thousand bucks and I had invested it in American Online with all the splits that they had early on, mm -hmm. two and a half years later, when I got married, that thousand dollar investment would have been just been worth just shy of four hundred grand. Oh Jeez. man! <laughs> so aye, aye. I should have never <laughs> looked, <laughs> because now I know exactly what it cost me to not uh, to not invest at that point. But yeah, that's. You know, I mean, I was out of high school before yeah. the internet was a thing, so it, it's a, it's a different uh, different world that you've grown up in, of course. But um, I'm fascinated by digital marketing because I have, like Landon, I've had kind of some 
I would call them bad interactions with digital marketing agencies that are out there. You know, we can do this and you can do that. And mm -hmm. You spend money on, you know, paid ads and you do Facebook and you do some LinkedIn and you do some Instagram. And I even did um, Waze, you know, yeah. ads at mm -hmm. one point. So, you know, there's all these different things that I've even looked at over the years. But so I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I know it's it's something that I feel I have a fairly good grasp on for, for people who do what I do for a for a living on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, there's so much more to it. And so it is important to find somebody who really knows what they're doing and, like you said, can specifically work in your niche marketplace. So that kind of leads me to, your, to my next question is, in your opinion, what's one industry that you're really intrigued by or interested in right now from a digital marketing standpoint? Uh, for for me personally, it's definitely um, the real estate I industry, and th and the reason why is just because of of inver inventory being so low, and then us, you know, the whole world ha going through this pandemic and, and and whatnot right now. So it's it's really interesting um, to me because uh, what we've always been really strong at is real estate, and so we've been actually watching this industry for a long time. We've always produced uh, uh, lead generation, specifically on the seller side of things, you know, producing seller leads. Um, and it's an interesting time because of the fact that the inventory is so low. You know, a lot of people are, are, are you know, holding on to their homes. They're saying, hey, you know what, this thing is worth a good penny um, right now. Some people don't want to move or, you know, the real estate agent um, is able to uh, not convince, but to, to kind of talk them through different options and kind of open up their eyes to s dir different opportunities um, in, in that sense. And there's a lot of people in the consideration phase because of the market um, – you know, uh, the the price values being so high, um, which man, when I went to D Denver, I looked up the my parents' house and I was like, man, that th that thing was worth like, uh, no, they bought it for eighty nine thousand at the time, and it's worth uh, over half a million right now. Um, just Colorado has just been just booming, and when I looked at the whole neighborhood, I'm like, ah, oh, man, all these homes are uh, like everything's in the six hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> so this this whole neighborhood is. Um, and but I uh, but that's happening a, uh, a lot everywhere in in, in the U S. and so uh, so it's an interesting time uh, for for us seeing how many people are actually in the consideration phase um, where they're not a hardcore really good seller lead but they're still filling out the home valuation form on on a page and they're curious um, and so and of course you go into you know everyone's different you know where they're what phase of life they're in you know, those, those types of decisions and, and stuff like that. But but that's one that's really interesting for me. Um, the other reason why it's really interesting for me is because of uh, you see a lot of um, content generation being done by, by real estate agents, which is great. You, you have to almost at this point. Um, uh, but what I am seeing is that because it's tough right now to do video, like people y before you, well, I guess things are opening up now, but, you know, a lot of uh, shows from real estate agents, they couldn't interview the the you know the local officials or they couldn't interview the local business owner uh, because the business was closed at that point or, or whatnot and so um, in terms of doing it face to face on a, on a video show um, and so that's why I s really start to, to um, get interested on on real estate agents s seeing them start to do podcasts I've seen that uh, a, a ton now if anything of real estate agents producing their own podcast basically taking their video show that they were producing and just making an audio form of it. Um, and the cool thing is about Zoom. I mean, if you want to start super basic, the the you know point of entry is very low too to be able to produce um, at least some decent content uh, because you see the Zoom calls um, being recorded and, and done everywhere now too. So um, so that's why I see a lot of opportunity because uh, like you know like most real estate agents, it's not like you have a huge huge budget to to throw into to marketing, um, but you have something, and so you have to be kind of careful of where you spend your dollar. And for me personally, um, content generation is something that you never lose out because it's an asset. Once the audio is produced, it lives forever. Once you produce the video, it lives forever. And so for me, um, if I invest money in something like that that I know lives forever, it's a really good investment uh, in that sense. And then you can, of course, like amplify it through advertising. Um, but at least having that asset where you can do whatever you like, you can take that long form piece of content and chop it up into highlights um, and run it over, you know, your content cal calendar for the next two months type of deal. Um, so that's why I'm really uh, interested in, in that market just because 
Um, I, last time I checked, the, the end of 2019, it was almost 1.4 million real estate agents in the U.S. And so, I mean, ev it's a huge market, um, and there's uh, there's a lot of competition. That's what makes it super super tough. Is there's a lot of competition, and um, so that so that's why it, to me I see content marketing as that way of the, your chance to at least be different in some way. Yeah. Yeah, we had some real estate agents on a few weeks ago, and they and one of them, the broker that was on, um, Steve Trang, actually has his own podcast that that he puts out for real estate, and I think it's done a lot of good things for him for his business. He he lives, you know, or I shouldn't say he uh, lives by it, but he he stands behind what it's done for him and for his business, and he's you know he's been at it for twenty plus years. And he's he he sees the value in it, and you're right that it provides this content that can be split up and used. And we do some of the same stuff with our show here, where we'll we'll take these sound bites and we'll put them out later. And some of them are evergreen, right? I mean, you can recycle them, you can use them again a year later, two years later, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, nobody nobody saw the content, and as long as the content itself is still relevant, yep. It it you're right. It's an asset. It's something that you can continue to use for a lot of time to come. Y yes, ex exactly. Yeah. And uh, in content generation, I mean, sometimes can get, um, you know, depending on your production value, you know, if you hire a, 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 a content marketing agency, you know, it can it can scale up or, or down, you know, you can go full production and, um, and, you know, make a hefty investment. But there's always an, there's always um, options in, in, in ways to be able to produce content in, in, in a way that's still within budget. And you know, not a, a huge strain, you know, um, for for small business owners because I, I think a lot of small business owners tend to sometimes uh, not go into that direction because they have a fear of budgeting or the work involved or anything like that. But um, it's actually it, it can be easier than what's probably anticipated in lots of cases. Yeah, I think the cost to entry is a, is a lot less than a, than a lot of people think, right? I mean, I I just. I did, so I'm I'm on the board of a nonprofit, and I think they're actually going to be the, the CEO or the chairman of the of the nonprofit's going to be on in a few weeks, I think. But um, they asked us to record just a quick 30 second video as to why this particular nonprofit is important to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I took the video at home, and I do a fair amount of video marketing with my business as well, and and you know I'm comfortable in front of a camera, I'm I'm good with all that. Well, they, they played this on a show, or on a, not on a show, but on a meeting that we did the other day, and they played back my video, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, the sound quality's good, my message was fine, but the quality of that video is terrible. So what did I do? The next day, I ordered a, a new webcam on Amazon, I, and I only paid like 30 bucks for it, yeah. but it's, you know, 1080p or 4K or whatever, and it's a much higher quality video than I had before. And then same thing, I ordered a new microphone to give me better vid better sound quality because I've been using my Beats headphones for Zoom calls and there's a little bit of a delay because of the Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. So it, and, and that microphone was like 20 bucks or something. And it was highly rated on Amazon. So the reality is you can really put all of this together f on a pretty shoestring budget if you're really committed to it and you understand the value. Oh, that, that, yeah, that's a, that's a, a great point. And um, I, I think sometimes even psychologically, I don't know why, but I think it's just a human thing, um, depending the the person and stuff like that, where they won't make those pers pers you know that purchase. Um, but you could easily spend fifteen dollars at Taco Bell. So <laughs> it's like the way. So so the way that's I a lot of food at Taco you know, Bell. I, for me, <laughs> oh man, I. I I, I yeah I, I spent fifteen dollars at Taco Bell. <laughs> First of all, that's impressive. But <laughs> go on. But but um, I was telling my brother the other day too. I'm like, man, dude, inflation is definitely happening. Like I like I see it on all these places. But the way I, I look at it is like, look, it's your business. This thing is like your life. This is how I view it uh, personally. So to make that investment of twenty bucks or even a couple hundred bucks on on stuff that's going to have longevity is like. I'll like done like I'm going to do it like you know yeah, yeah. I, I I love that I actually oh man I, I wish I could tell you guys where I heard it because I just heard it in the last couple of days but it was a uh, you know small business guru you know guy and he was mm -hmm. he was talking about that and oh it was in a book that I was reading um uh he was saying you know helping he helps business owners look at investing their business dollars not looking at it as an expense yeah. right it's not a line item it is 
it is an investment that you are deliberately making back into your business because you could take that money out of the business and put it in your own pocket, but you are deliberately and consciously making that decision to invest that money back into your business mm -hmm. with an ROI expectation. Yep. Which leads right into my next question. So you mentioned something about uh, a, a budget. Um, so this is kind of a two-part question. Uh, so with a lot of buzzwords in, t in today's business and marketing world, people say paid media. So first of all, help us understand exactly what that means, what that entails, and then if you can, maybe segue that into uh, a small business that's looking to engage your agency. What can they expect to invest with you guys on, let's say, a monthly, a monthly budget, and how long should they really commit to working with you before they can start seeing some results? Yeah, no, th that's a great question. Um, so the, the word paid media for us is essentially a, a, an a umbrella term. Uh, it wi within it, it, of course, is Facebook ads, uh, within you know in Instagram ads in there too, um, LinkedIn advertising, uh, Google ads, Bing ads, um, uh, and then within Google you have YouTube advertising. Those are the five networks that that really uh, describe paid media for us. Even though there's tons of other platforms, I mean TikTok is is one that they've opened it up for advertising and stuff like that too. So. Um, but for us, it's those five main main uh, platforms. Um, for a small business, uh, let's say more s more so like a, a service based company um, that's looking for lead generation. Uh, typically, for a small business, they're going to spend between two grand to you know uh, three grand if they kind of want to be a, li a little bit heavier uh, per month with ad spend and everything. Um, that's basically pretty much the norm right now. Is is that price range right now? Um, for for businesses that are, if anything, probably closer to five, four or five million a year in revenue, they're usually spending five, six uh, grand a month around there in, in paid media. Um, and the other, and the thing to look at paid media, uh, I mean, it's a com commodity. It's like it's water in terms of like you can turn it on, turn it off. If you want traffic that from a specific you know keyword or, or traffic from a specific interest uh, in a specific geographic location. Um, you can you can launch it right away and be able to attain that traffic. Um, what what's important is finding um, the right partner to make sure that not not about just attaining the traffic, uh, but that the actual strategy in terms of how you're converting that traffic is in place because that's where things get ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, if if you don't have the home base that's actually going to convert that traffic, um, then it's 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 a wash at that point. Um, there's, there's. I'm missing a second part to your, to your question. That it oh went. It yeah, I said. Uh, so I if a uh, uh, small business engages you, uh, you've laid out, you know, the the services. They're on board, and they say, you know, how much you kind of laid out how what what price range they can expect, but how long do they typically need to be committed to start seeing results? D definitely. Yeah. So so. Especially with, uh, say, if it's like a new industry, usually a 90 days is a testing phase to really get into the point where you're actually by basically by the end of 90 days, leads are coming through, and not only the leads coming through, but the strategy is saying, okay, cool, we know what's working, wh what's working and what's not type of deal. Um, really, the the 90 day mark is um, pretty pretty the extent of it. Um, a lot of times it's sooner than that, and especially with industries um, that we're really familiar with. That's more like that's actually more turnkey, if anything, because we uh, we know the nuances of the of the industry and the strategy to to execute um, at that point. So industries, for example, like real estate, those are really um, uh, you know we could we could start generating leads type of thing tomorrow type of thing. But the only reason why is because we've been involved in that industry so much, so we know what works and what doesn't, um, and we've seen that whether it's there's market swings or even a pandemic. There's still a ton of search in, uh, interest for you know uh, people that are considering selling their home. Um, so so yeah, but I think on, on definitely on average, um, especially for new industries um, that are that are emerging um, or or that there's like that is kind of tough. I mean, like the CBD market, you can it's a it's a little bit more open up now, but there's still you gotta be careful in, in some ways. Those typically still, you know, 60 to 90 days is pretty average to, to start generating results. And then from there, 
by the end of the 90 days, it's saying like, okay, cool, the foundation's done, now let's scale this. Uh, and it and depends on the business goal. Does it need to be scaled? You know, how many how many leads do they actually need for their sales uh, team to 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 close? What's their closing rate? Kind of just doing like the reverse engineer, just backwards math, yeah. um, to to m make sure that the marketing efforts are actually mapped out to the the, bu the business goals uh, at that point. Yeah. So <coughs> I've got kind of the same question, but you know, there's paid media and then there's search engine optimization, right? And in my mind, the two kind of work together, but they are truly separate. So mm -hmm. maybe explain a little bit more of, of what search engine optimization is and, and how does somebody dial that in to their own business? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they do work together, especially, I mean, there's always going to, there's users that will never click on a paid ad on search on, on, a, on a search network. Like, well, they'll, they'll conduct a search um, query and they'll never cl click a, an ad. They'll always just go to organic. And then you have other people that are, you know, okay with it and they'll click on the ad. And so th the reason why I mentioned that is because you essentially have two groups of people. Um, if you want to dominate a market 100%, then you kind of have to have both placements, both paid and the organic side of things, um, if you wanted 100% of it. Um, and, then, and of, of course, the great thing of, of organic is once you do attain those rankings, um, and you continue to maintain them, that is, you know, I don't like to say it's free traffic because you still had to hire someone to get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was still an expense. But the thing is that organic traffic um, uh, for certain industries does even tend to uh, convert at a higher rate. That it's just a b better quality traffic. Um, so th but th so those, those two definitely work together. Um, in terms of search engine optimization, kind of just to uh, lay out just, I guess, some um, context, there's on-site optimization, and then off-site uh, SEO, uh, for you know SEO uh, as well. On-site is actually ties into what we we're talking about earlier. When you're building your website, making sure that the actual foundation of the site's in place, and on-site SEO is factored into that. So basically, this how I view it: is when someone lands on your website, um, they should be able to clearly understand what 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 you guys offer um, and some of the benefits and a way to take action. Maybe in the top half of the page. In the top, yeah. Okay. Usually this is done by a headline, uh, a, a subline, like maybe a little paragraph that's maybe even just one sentence, two sentences. Sometimes you'll see some bullet points, uh, and you'll see a visual, like whether it's imagery or, uh, which I highly recommend, is like even like a video. Um, and underneath those bullet points, sometimes there's a button that's that's a call to action uh, to be able to, to, to take action. Then from there, you know, if that's not sufficient enough, for the user to take action, they scroll down and, and strategically then that's when you go into social proof, whether it's testimonials, um, uh, more information on uh, the actual company itself or the, the service line. If you want to guide people, if maybe you have a suite of services or a suite of products that you want to guide them towards, um, that's where that, that customer journey starts to expand there. Um, but the reason why I bring all that up is because that's, uh, like without having on-site SEO, you could do all the off-site you want. It's not, and it's not going to be sustainable rankings. Maybe, maybe you can have a website that's, let's say, 50% there, and you do a ton of off-site SEO. Maybe you can get a ranking for a little bit, but at some point, Google's always continuously grading your site. So at some point, they, they can they can grade it again and say, you know what? Yeah, we made a mistake, and then de -rank, like lower your rankings. Um, so that's why I, I'm. It, it's really crucial just to get the the on-site done. Um, this even means. The, the site, how it's organized, the pages, the, the main navigation, um, the schema that's in the, in the background. Um, because basically, the search engine's trying to think almost like a human, in a sense. It's, it's trying to say, uh, you know, I obviously I want the, the best results uh, for my search query. Um, how, do I, how do I get that type of deal? Um, and the search engines are, are really just mapping out to what a user actually needs. And that's what Google's goal is, is to provide the best search engine results possible to, to their end user. Um, so having on-site is the first thing. Once you have the on-site, say you're a new business, you essentially have no authority. So for example, um, th I like to use this analogy is, uh, so right now, not the whole, like the whole world doesn't know me. But if I went on Oprah, I would have, it, my life would probably change a little bit tomorrow. Like, it'd probably <laughs> be a little bit different. But the reason why is because of her authority has has trickled down to me in some way. There's still some dilution there, but it's trickled to me in, in some way. And so that's how I describe off-site SEO is you have your website, 
And the whole objective uh, of offsite SEO is to essentially uh, attain external backlinks, so links from uh, other high authority websites to link back to yours. Um, we don't want to say make these webs these sites these links anything. They should be relevant. They should be relevant to your industry, your service, um, or your product in, in some way. Because that's how Google starts to really understand um, not only who you are but who you're affiliated with, and they start and that's how you start to increase your authority. As you increase your authority, that's where your rankings start to show up. Uh, because now you're saying you're with your on-site, you're making claims about something, but now you have the actual authority from your off-site mm -hmm. that's validating your claim. And that's how you start to, to get rankings, um, not that just appear, but they're also sustainable. So that's, that's the, the, the big thing there. Um, for local businesses, Google My Business, that profile, even though it, it, I, uh, it may look so basic, that's like half of your SEO right there that, that a, lo a lot of local businesses um, sometimes miss out on because they kind of, it's underestimated of how impactful uh, their Google My Business profile really is. Um, and so that's why we preach, you know, uh, uh, always having a, a process or a system in place to continuously gather reviews because those reviews are your social proof and um, Google is actually looking at reviews uh, as well, your social proof across the web to, uh, as an authority point. That's a that's a point of authority. So, um, so that's how uh, I always explain it. As far as like, just make sure that your foundation's put in place, then start building all your uh, authority offsite. Um, that way, you'll actually attain rankings that are sustainable and and hold lo longevity at that point. Yeah. So, <coughs> I want to go back a little bit. You talk about you know Google dropping your rankings, right? So they'll rank you somewhere and then you say, oh no, I, ma I made a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the buzzwords that I hear all the time is they change the algorithms, Yeah. right? So help us understand what that, what that means and why that affects, you know, your SEO and your rankings. For sure. So, I mean, that algorithm, I mean, algorithms are changing, uh, I mean, maybe even a, a, a ton of times, even just during this conversation type of deal. It, it's so... It's so fast, and it's becoming even faster and faster with machine learning um, that's implemented and, and, and all that stuff. So, um, so that's why I, I really preach of like just do the right thing, and do white hat SEO, <laughs> uh, do the do the right thing, and always be focused on the user standpoint uh, in terms of uh, their their experience. If you're doing it that way, you're always mapped out to what Google looks for in in, in their actual algorithms. Um, if the algorithm changed and you lost rankings, it's because they they did grade you at a lower point. They said, yeah, you know, you know if anything, you don't have enough social proof, you don't have enough authority. Um, or uh, also, one thing that is forgotten a lot is that all the competitors are doing the same. So a, a, a local business that is active with their local um, SEO efforts, sometimes they lose sight that all their other competitors are doing the same thing as them. They're trying to get, and there's only 10 spots on the first page, and only the top five are actually getting a high click-through um, anyways. So um, so that's that's why SEO really never ends. SEO is a continuous thing, just like paid media. Um, but the reason why SEO is continuous is because your competitors are always looking to take your position. So they're always looking to uh, build their backlink profiles bigger and with more authority. Um, and if it gets to the point where they, they built more authority than you, then yeah, Google will have to, uh, you know, lower your rankings um, and give them the, the spot. Um, but so it's it's free range uh, for for businesses to to put in the effort or to not, you know. Uh, but that's why from from a local SEO standpoint, um, it's important to always continue to nurture your backlink profile. Like your on-site SEO, once you've done it once. You really don't have to tinker it with it, especially when it's uh, if you if you did it good and right with the site build. There's no reason why to go back and change title tags or meta descriptions, um, unless you have data proving of why you, you need to, um, or maybe you added a new page that needs to be optimized. Um, but once honestly, once on site's done, you can dive into backlinking um, and make sure that that backlink profile is always really healthy and uh, carries a lot of high authority relevant websites. So. Basically, what you're saying is that Google knows and tracks every single piece of data. Of course. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if they don't like what they see, they knock us down in the rankings, essentially, right? Yeah. It, 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 that, um, but it's always because it's focused on the, uh, the user. Like, meaning 
Google doesn't want to recommend you um, a garage door repair company that gives, you know, not so good service. They want to they want to give you like the best. And so for a search engine to to be able to evaluate that, they have to look at all these factors. There's over 200 factors they have to look into. They have to look at the authority of the site. They have to look at the reviews. Um, they have to see, okay, are these reviews only from Google or do they have them on Yelp and Facebook too? Uh, stuff like that. And so, um, and and they'll even look at the frequency of the reviews. Did this guy get reviews like 100 in one day or is it 100 over the course of three years because they're actually real? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so those are the things that they're they're looking at in, um, but yeah, from my point of view, um, that's how we we always tackle SEO is really what's good for the user because that's what Google that's what that's what Google maps out to in terms of uh, being able to produce the best you know search results possible for the end user's query. Yeah, yeah. Th they're not just guessing. I mean, there's a reason that you've got four just for men ads on the side <laughs> of your screen at all times. <laughs> <laughs> <and then. laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, on that note, Bobby, we've, we've really appreciated having you on the program today. Um, there's been some, some there's been some great insights um, that you provided to us on, on the show today. S I've learned some things and I've been Wonderful. you know trying to dial us di dial this in for my own business for, for quite some time and so I, you know I appreciate the interactions. but just real quick, tell us where you know where our listeners can find you online or, or however you'd like to share your information yeah absolutely um one thing that i'm having a lot of fun with is our, our show at signal called the uh, blueprint um we launched it uh a little over a year ago um this past m month sep september uh that COVID stuff like kicked me out for two weeks so I, like it was such a bummer because we we're like on schedule you know doing this uh more repeatedly and being able to answer questions quicker um, but yeah, we shoot it. Uh, ba it's a weekly show, so I'm gonna uh, this weekend we're gonna start it up again, and uh, and it's a show where I just candidly answer uh, questions that have to do with digital marketing. So if uh, any of the listeners do have questions um, that are really specific to their exact scenario, um, all they have to do is uh, go to our website signalmarketing.com. Um, they can submit it as a contact form, or honestly, you can go on I, uh, all of our social media platforms. Everything is at Signal Marketing. You can direct message us on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Um, I mean a lot of times we even have uh, posts that, that ask for more questions and stuff, and we just ask that uh, people place them as comments, and, um, and then we just curate those questions and answer them on the, the next episode. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the best way, and that's the, that's the funnest way, especially for us to be able to continue to provide value. Cool. Very cool. Thanks again for being here, and we look forward to staying in touch over the months to come. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot, Bobby. That was great. Thank you. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.